This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Not really. Um, but uh, if this, I don't know how many folks. So how about start with this? How many folks, this, you've, this is your first FreeBSD Developer Summit you've attended? Wow, very cool. Um, welcome, if, we haven't, uh, if I haven't already talked to you in person. Um, so one of the things we do at the Developer Summit in Canada every year is we normally we'd spend the first half of the morning, but I really wanted Colin to be able to go first this morning. So we're going to do um, part of this discussion now and part of it after lunch. So we'll kind of split up into two sessions. Um, and we're just going to spend a lot of time brainstorming and talking through things that people want to work on and time for 15.0, which Colin, if we go with kind of your uh, proposed schedule, what's your, I can't remember, when would 15.0 maybe? By the end of 2025. By the end of 2025. So, so use that as your guideline thinking, what's something I can have land in the tree perhaps by the middle of 2024? So think of Q3 2024 as your deadline. Yes. Yes, I should say middle of 2025. It's kind of, for now, for today's purpose, think of end of Q2 2025, what I think is realistic. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about what, oh, <laughs> we're going to kind of, we have some categories, I'll introduce them as we go, but we're going to kind of talk through different areas of things, and that's, but that, keep that timeline in your head of what's kind of feasible. Um, if something is, not feasible in that timeline, then it's not worth bringing up today. Like we'll talk about it, and you know, when we get further along in the future, and it falls into the timeline window. Um, but we're going to be focusing on thinking about planning cooperatively. It's a very much a group participation session, um, including folks online, of what we want to kind of as a community work on during the next year and a half, I guess, um, or almost a year until uh, preparing for 15.0. So the first thing we have does not take very long. Um, well, I should also amend. Uh, so we have a HackMD that I occasionally push to GitHub, so it's mirrored over on a, a GitHub repository I have. Like I have a document for 14.0 as well that we used previously. But this is kind of a living document that gets updated over time. And so over time as things get done, for example, uh, these things in the completed, uh, the first time when we talked last year, none of those were completed yet. They were things that were kind of in other stages in our, our workflow here. And then as they got done, they get moved up. And then uh, occasionally we'll update this every conference and sometimes in between, and we, we can kind of see the history and at the end of a release we can kind of see what we ended up, the things that we maybe talked about, how many of them actually got done or did not. Um, so the first thing or th the first category, very short, are things that are completed. Um, you can add more stuff to here that is not even listed if you want, but in general we like to move things up. So I know I have two of the things, I, I, I looked at this about a month ago and even since then, there are two of the things down in the current have, which I'll explain in a second that I can move up. Um, my NVMe stuff, I got committed, so if someone wants to move that one earlier in the table, uh, feel free. Just try to follow the pattern of adding a reference to the commit when it was merged. And I think also Mark told me that one of these, the one that's using like inline function tracing with dtrace, this one I think has also been moved or has been committed and merged, so it could move up to the have. Is that true? Yeah. Quite, a Quite a while ago. Okay. So I don't know if this is just a provider or if this is the wrapper and user space to kind of make it pretty. Yeah, no, that's, that's, still, not, that's still not like that. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So someone can at least move this one, and if you follow the link to the review, you can probably find the commit so that you, it's easy to tag and kind of match it up. Um, so it is a HackMD, so anybody can edit it. Uh, the link should be um, on IRC and other places. It should probably be on the wiki page. Feel free to splat the link in other places if, you, if necessary and help other people to find it. Uh, I can't see the comments online. So uh, if, if you see something that someone says um, on IRC or if anybody's watching the YouTube chat, hopefully, um, feel free to jump in and, on the mic and relay it. Um, Ed is going to play the part of running around with a microphone instead of me this time. Um, so, yes, feel free, to, especially things that have done, feel free to go ahead and move it. Um, we'll see if the page auto updates or not. 
I'm not sure it always does. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, keep in mind that if several people are editing at once, try to, I think HackMD, when you're in the edit mode, will show you that people are nearby you. So try to not stomp on each other's toes too much, but normally it works out fine. So the way this is going to work is we have different kind of sections. So completed is pretty easy. That doesn't, that's not one we talk about too much. Um, the next section we have, which is where we're going to kind of spend our first chunk of time, are, are, is like a blob of code that you have, um, but it's not in the tree, it's out of the tree. Uh, something that's a have is probably like mostly complete, but it might be kind of hacky and need some massaging to kind of be more upstreamable, but it is a thing that you have that you would like to merge upstream um, in some form or fashion, but you might need some cleanup. Um, so you, the thing is kind of a, a brief description of what it is. Everything on the list needs an owner, which is kind of the responsible person who could be bugged about it or queried about what the status is. If it has no owner, it can't really make the list. Um, and then the last column can kind of get updated based on when we, when it, for example, if a review shows up, it can get edited over time to have that. Um, or if there's a URL to a patch or things like that. Um, so the first thing we might go over then are, are have. So if, if there's something on here that your name is already tied to that you want to update, go ahead. Is it, can anyone tell me if it's updating or if I need to switch to, it is updating? Okay, mm. mine is, all right, sweet. Okay, um, so I won't actually talk through these too much, but if people want to add new ones, uh, you can raise your hand, you can edit the wiki, you can edit the page as we go. Um, Perhaps please stay in the have for now if you're like going too far ahead editing until we get to the other sections. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, let's do it, folks in the room. Colin, I saw first. We, we might go not in strictly. Uh, yeah, we might go in like, what order does it involve Ed taking a thousand steps? <laughs> uh, I have some improvements to PowerD that uh, hook into patches to the scheduler, which will make it a lot better on multi-core laptops. Okay, is that a like, okay, it's a have, never mind, yes. So, can someone edit it because I'm not near a keyboard? Or I'll have to get the chalkboard out. Ah, there it's happening, okay. Who's next? So, I have, <laughs> I have a port of the Juniper 9P file system. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a review, it is rebasing. It nearly works. So I'd like to get it into the tree soon so then we'll get people to break it and stuff. Okay, so 9PFS client. Very cool, that's Brooks Under was over here. Uh, DFR. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so assorted cherry prerequisites. I don't think we'll get a full cherry import, but um, I'm gonna start, we're gonna start merging constants that uh, we need to reserve and things like that, um, where it's be, where it would start causing us ABI breaks and flag days um, that we'd like to avoid. And we might, how much we merge, I don't know, but definitely and some things like uh, auxiliary argument flags, which are catastrophic to everything if you, I have to renumber them, yes. So ABI bits, yeah. Yeah, ABI, ABI bits. ABI bits, kind of re reserving bits of ABI that we know we'll need. And that's Brooks, yep. Maybe annotate the 9P file system with being like FreeBSD VFS support or something like, as, so we can mount a 9P file system. Okay. All right, so, uh, I've had for quite a while uh, a diff that will let us build the default TCP stack as a module, which allows yeah. for rebootless upgrades to the TCP code if you know there's a bug, for example, that needs to be fixed. The, there are no bugs in TCP. That, that's very optimistic. I, <laughs> well, let's go with that. But just in case. Um, the, the big thing I think it's missing is really all the UX questions about how someone would actually use it. And so the, the code to make it happen is relatively simple. It's done um, somehow some 
someone needs to figure out the UX pieces so that we can make it so that it's actually useful for people. Okay. And that's JTL as the owner. Who's next? <laughs> someone needs to own the. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe we can add that. Yeah, we can have that as a need or something. The uh, having a good UI. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. I will be working on the Union FS, uh, funded by the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, so I, I saw a line uh, about overlay FS at the end of the document. Okay. And hopefully in one yeah in one year we can have something uh, quite stable. Maybe not all the bell and whistles that uh, I'm envisioning, but something that can be used and tested. Um, so, well, I'm going to wiggle a little bit. Is it a, a like thing that's in progress, or is it a thing that's mostly done? No, no, it needs it, clean up. Yeah, it's just started. Okay, so in progress, and so that'll probably land. We haven't gotten there yet, but that'll probably be okay. okay. A new category this year is in progress. <clears throat> Thanks. So, <clears throat> I think UnionFS will be in progress. Maybe. Okay. So one that I've been working on is um, just support for unprivileged Beehive without certain features like PCI pass-through, but like the kind of core, like most of the core I.O. controls okay. would be usable. Like you, I think you'd still have a separate VMM group and then you'd need, uh, you'd need appropriate permissions to actually use it. So by default, it wouldn't be unprivileged Beehive, but um, you don't need to be, or you wouldn't need to be root. Okay. If that makes sense. So that, does that qualify as a have? No. That, that would be in progress. Okay. I guess I should just go ahead and it. <laughs> All right. Again, we're kind of mixing, but that's fine. So is it on here already? User rootless beehive or something? Is that what you're unprivileged beehive? Yeah. Okay. And that's a Mark J. All right. Other haves. Let's try to do haves for a bit. So we wander into in progress. Uh, so I have uh, hierarchical uh, rate limits for ZFS done, ready for review. It's waiting for review. So that's a have. I have worked on a graphical inversion of the installer. Um, it's ready for review. Needs polishing in some places, and also your opinions. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry. Happy to discuss it. Where am I on time to? Um, back to the 9PFS thing, we in Juniper actually have some private changes and fixes around the uh, file system that's not synced up yet uh, with the public repository. So hopefully can join effort uh, on making it into the tree. Well, so we can maybe head more towards the end progress things. So in the past, we kind of didn't have a separate end progress. And the other categories I'll mention that we'll get to later are things that are not yet in progress. Like, and we have them categorized as things that are a need, like you, you need this for a project you're going to do, and things that are a kind of a want, more of a nice to have. And those will be more what we get into after lunch. Um, so just in terms of framing about how to categorize things. <laughs> Um, in progress is something that you're kind of currently working on, or you have a partial implementation, but it's not really a have. It still needs a fair bit of work before it's going to be ready for upstreaming. So it looks like people have already added several things, um, like an IMMU driver for AMD. I know the foundation mentioned that yesterday. Constantine is happily, well, I don't know if happily is the right word, but he's working on it. Oh, he's happy. <laughs> oh no. 
I don't know what that means. Um, maybe my Wi-Fi is dying. Third cuddle. So is this Alan? Are you volunteering, Des, to do this? Or did? Okay, so I came in from Iris, from Iris from online. Uh, did Manu add this, or did Warner add this on Manu's behalf of <laughs> pulling DRM back into base? Okay. Do you want to say anything about uh, these two items you added, Warner? Oh, do you need? Okay. Oh, I have the mic. Okay. I have Fine. A, a patch for dtrace SDT probes, wherein you can create a probe in your code without having this ugly memory accessing branch that we currently have. But it uses okay. a compiler feature called Asm Goto, and LLVM sufficiently old LLVM versions don't support that. And as a kind of side discussion, I'm wondering what what is the sort of minimum required toolchain we have for the for the kernel these these days, because I know like the Mac OS CI job uses LVM 13 or something like that, which is too old, which is yeah. the only reason I haven't committed this thing. Uh, and I think it's somewhat arbitrary. We've just kind of, we've, we've left some of the little CI jobs kind of pinned at whatever we think the oldest is to kind of keep it working. Okay. Um, but not because, like I think now we even have a gap in the middle. So I think we have like 12, 13, and 14 in the CI actions, and we're up to like 18 in head. So it means that we don't actually test something in the middle. Um, so I guess the question is, does anyone care? Like, who, who cares about making old LLVM versions work? Uh, yeah, how old are we? I think Asm Goto appeared in like 15, 16-ish. So older than that. I know, I know Cherry folks care about LLVM 15, because I think that's where Cherry LLVM is at. Not yet. <laughs> um, I, do other people have a vested interest? In, and the other tool chain question is, um, what about GCC? I, it compiles it. I haven't We mostly only test compiling with GCC anyway. A lot of it's yeah. about warning coverage and so it forth. Makes sense to work just because of such a weird compiler feature that I want to make sure that I can send it. I, I think what I'm doing is pretty. pretty okay. So, because I think Mark, Mark wasn't mic'd, so for the stream, um, we believe that the current versions of GCC we support would work fine. With that, it's really just a question of LVM versions. Warner. Okay, so the things I added are um, DevD um, events for errors. Uh, we record a little bit of data, and we'll do the full sense buffer for SCSI and a few other things for NVMe. Um, I have that kind of working, but it, Missing a couple pieces. Uh, NVMe reset and recovery just needs final testing um, in a harsh environment where I need this. Uh, <coughs> the non harsh environments, it's working fine. Uh, Kboot support for AMD64, it's about 80% right now. It'll panic in the middle. I'll be working on that this summer. Um, and Chuck uh, Tuffley and I are working on uh, uh, Linux uh, IOCTL compat for NVMe. So you can run things like NVMe CLI, uh, either as the Linux binary or as a native port that I've done uh, on FreeBSD. So. And if you get a chance, if I know you have an open review, if you can add the review URL. The, the which one? Uh, oh, the URL. OK, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I thought you were asking me to add one more thing, not no, the no, URL no. for it. <laughs> no, but like, uh, it's nice if we can actually put the review. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add that as soon as I figure out which one it is. Um, in which case, that's actually more of a have, quite frankly, if you're to the point of having a review rather than an M. Okay. Oh, we need the mic. Um, so I have a I have some stuff for Beehive that adds um, uh, Direct Linux kernel loading support, so you don't. So if you've used QMU dash kernel um, like that, so you, um, it implements the loader protocol, puts the kernel right in there. You don't need a DC image and stuff to boot off. So it's really good for like just really fast one shot VMs, and it kind of it benefits a lot with um, rootless Beehive, and it benefit it would benefit from 9PFS as well. 
um, lot like they play in similar areas. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a like a working prototype of that, which I'll be presenting in a couple of days. But I've pushed it and stuff, and so there's been some. It's far enough along that it could be. Sounds like I have to me. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty close. I, I, this would be my first um, work of any substance. So it's like, I don't entirely know how to judge the size, but um, I think it wouldn't be a big lift to have it done in time. Yeah. And if polished. it's functional, mm. that, that, that's more of a have than a, like an in progress. Okay. So, so I think that's, called, that's a have. Okay. Yeah, I think um, have really is code exists and the reason it's not in the tree yet is review or need help with refining for refining upstream or things like that. That sort of thing, yeah. As opposed to like it half works and it panics if you like look at it weird. That's that's more of the in progress. <laughs> okay, some other ones that people have added that we haven't talked about yet maybe. Um, do you want to talk about Splice? You mentioned it yesterday, I think, Mark. Yeah, uh, so this is a feature. It's it's an interface that comes from OpenBSD, but it basically lets you take two TCP sockets and just splice them together so that data received on one socket is automatically transmitted on the other one. Um, so you don't need to bounce all of your data through user space. Um, so that's useful for uh, at least you know proxies. Um, and we're planning to uh, make sure that it integrates cleanly with KTLS so that you can do like um, you, you can basically intercept TLS sessions if that's what your policy says you need to do. Um, so hopefully with yeah less overhead than what you'd have to do today. Um, but not as general as like kind of Splice and Linux where you can kind of take arbitrary descriptors, in theory at least, and bind them together. This is a more targeted interface. And it lets you do things like, you know, after n bytes of transmitted data, you can, you can unsplice um, or after some timeout. Uh, so there's, there's a bit more room to, you know, define policy around that. Okay. <laughs> so for the stream, that's Jonathan saying that Mark should talk to Drew. All right, uh, it's, do you want to say anything about this, Brooks, versus what's on the slide? Yeah, so I'd like to finalize the ABI for libc at least or for libsys um, so that we can claim some sort of stability and start pushing uh, like language runtime vendors to use it uh, the main thing that I have at the moment is that for upgrade compatibility I want to put stubs for the public symbols in libc um, that's going to require some slightly evil uh, generated C or else even more horrid assembly tail call, so I don't want to write, write and debug assembly tail call, so I'm not going to and make the compiler do it for me. Um, but it should be straightforward. I'm basically at this point going to wait for uh, Kyle's uh, GSOC student uh, to finish work on uh, make syscalls dot Lua um, before I add a whole bunch more crap to it. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, maybe yeah, for those who don't know, libsys uh, take, took the actual making of syscalls out of libc and put it into another library, which is a filter library. Um, so it's basically it puts them all in one place, um, makes it easier to restrict them, makes it easier to handle compartmentalization. Um, also, potentially, you could replace the implementation. Um, so you could have a wrapped implementation. Um, there was some work at Waterloo that did that. Um, so yeah. Just try to sort of decouple libc from the system ABI interface. Do we want Brooks to start um, trying to tee up uh, uh, language runtime maintainers to, uh, to to schedule or like plan for this? I, I'm just I'm thinking of the. Um, uh, the ordeal that we went through with Go and with Rust, um, trying to move from a long ago deprecated FreeBSD to a less, uh, less still depre deprecated but less deprecated, <laughs> less deprecated FreeBSD. <laughs> yeah, I guess my thought my thought there is that um, I would like us to start working with them. The question is probably, I wouldn't MFC the split 
um, but I bite MFC the existence of Libsys. However, it wouldn't really be an MFC. It would be like just grabbing the stuff and moving it. Um, there's just too many commits. There's something like 100, there's well over 100 commits uh, to do the split and address an assortment of uh, long-time deficiencies in our symbol our symbol tables and things like that we're just we've had terrible hygiene in terms of maintaining symbol versions um and you know doing things like losing losing symbols over time has been a something we've definitely had happen and in fact um in the time between when i first turned on hey you can't link unless you have all the symbols that you declared um and when i had to back that out and then reapplied it <laughs> we gained new it ones. took me it took me several days to fix all the regressions. Um, so quite a bit of work. I guess I will say one uh, in progress that I'll, I'll mention is a slightly better symbol ABI checker um, that would both tell you, you know, well, we'll, well, rather than saying, okay, if it's declared in the symbol file, it has to exist. It would be a dump of all the symbols and their versions. And then you can... You know, you'll have diffs you'll have to update every time you add a symbol to s libraries that we choose to add these things for, um, but at least have a bit more ABI stability. It's not a full ABI checker because um, the full ABI checkers are like, you know, giant piles of Perl and Python that parse elf and dwarf and all sorts of things, but it would be something we could have in tree. And so I want to finish that. <laughs> okay, so a lightweight user space ABI checker might be the way to describe yeah. that. Okay, uh, one thing I think we didn't do, we also wanna go through things that are on here to see if any of them are stale or no longer relevant. Uh, so I don't think we did that with have, the stuff that was here from before. So Pavel, you have these two. I know you've done some things with copy file range and some other utilities. Reload the page, oh, okay. Well, we'll see if it works. Copy file range is in install uh, done okay. by Martin Matuska. I have a patch to uh, for a uh, simple API, and I replace uh, all the individual calls to copy file range and fallbacks to read write with a simple function mm -hmm. in CP install MV and uh, cat. So that's uh, there is a PR. Uh, one objection is from Das that. Uh, <laughs> it might be better to bring copy file uh, API from uh, Mac OS. Uh, so uh, Bruce Evans uh, declared that he would like to take a look. Uh, sorry. Uh, Jesus, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forgot who was that. Kyle. 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 Okay. Close. Sorry, guys. Uh, so yes, so I will wait for this uh, if he decide to do it or not uh, before merging. So okay, so that's kind of the wrapper, and I guess all right. So they're all still coming. I will update with the PRs. Perfect. Uh, has the SV stuff? Does anyone know if that's all landed or if that's still in progress for Hopefully ARM sixty four? We'll uh, respond in a moment. Or we can, if the review is still open, then it's clearly still in progress. Uh, oh, I think I've, I know I've talked to Mark about this one earlier, so I think it's still in the, this state. It's not certainly not done. It's still a have. This is the uh, k exec oh. kernel for crash dump thing. I think. Yeah, we're we're waiting for a project to start that would give us some time to to actually upstream it. So the implementation is done. Um, I haven't rebased it in a while, but if anyone's interested in it, I've talked about it several times before. Uh, it's basically a, a mechanism that lets you k exec a rescue kernel after a kernel panic, and then you can, you know, configure that kernel to dump all the memory to a file system. And so that way you don't need a dedicated dump device or anything like that. Um, but it does, yeah, uh, there's the, the functionality is all done, but the UI probably needs a bit more refinement. But yeah. Um, and then 
so IOVIC wrapper is the thing we have in TreeBSD. Um, is that what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so I have a set of wrapper macros in CherryBSD um, because our ca the casts all vary um, in hybrid kernels where some pointers are capabilities. Um, I think it's generally an, a readability improvement um, versus having to do casts and to do addition and things like that. Uh, so it's probably worth merging, but I just haven't done it. Yeah, so I think like for folks who may not know, I think like there's a macro to like Initialize an IO VEC, like you give a pointer to the VEC and you give it a base and a link, and it does it for you. Yeah. Um, which avoids some duplicated code often when you're going through a loop and populating the darn things. And there's, um, there's also and there's like an advance, which is really useful, yeah. right? Which moves the pointer and decrements the length and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hardware watch points in Beehive. So uh, Bojan is now a committer. <laughs> um, but he was a GSOC student a couple of summers ago, and some of the work he did was single stepping for AMD CPUs that has been merged. I don't recall if, there, if this part is in his Git branch or if he's actually open reviews, but he had changes to allow you to, um, it, it kind of violates the guest if the guest tries to use hardware watch points, I believe, but otherwise you can kind of use hardware watch points like the debug registers of x86 to set a breakpoint or watch point when your guest is running to use over the GDB stub, which is kind of nice. Um, and I know he has patches to do that. I just don't remember if they're in a review or not. Uh, we already talked about the inline function tracing. Uh, Chuck is here. Yep. Still I have. Still I have? Yes. Oh, yeah. Don't have the mic yet, but we'll, we'll run it to you. Yep, that's still I have. Okay, for SquashFS. <laughs> Okay, uh, Colin already mentioned PowerD. Okay, I think we've talked a bit. Oh, this is hierarchical rate limits rate for limits. CFS and Pavel. All right, that's perfect. Okay, so I want to make sure we got through all of those. Um, let me look at the time. It's 11.30, so we've kind of made it through our first half hour. Ah, why don't we start, and we may not quite finish through lunch, uh, let's talk about the next category. So the next two categories are a little more, like there's maybe not code yet or very very little code yet. Um, uh, so these are a little more wish listy, aspirational. Uh, but the first one is something called need, which is more, it's a wish list thing, but I really kind of need it for something that's going to ship using 15.0. Like if I'm building a product or I'm building a service of some sort, I really kind of need this as a thing to make it viable, as opposed to a want, which is much more, I mean, it's, it's kind of a pony, unicorn, fairy in the sky sorts of things. Um, so um, we have several in here already. Uh, I still need a new ELF <laughs> kernel dump format. Um, and Cherry, uh, we have extra metadata stored in RAM, uh, these kind of one-bit tags associated with words. and. And I've defined it, I have a, uh, I've negotiated with, because ARM also, we, we, we kind of negotiated a way to, to store this in core dumps for ELF for user space, where we store packed bit, uh, packed bit masks of the tags for RAM. And I need to do that for kernels as well, because when we have a kernel crash dump, we want to be able to see what, which pointers were valid or invalid. Um, and our current kernel crash dump format is um, very bespoke and so therefore not very easily extensible. And I, would, I, I have various ideas in my head of how we can make it be an ELF file again and just have some tweaks when necessary, in which case it becomes a more natural way to store things like uh, memory metadata in the core dump. So that's still a project I have, but I have not started. Maybe I'll get to it this year. Finished package base is a very broad topic. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I think primarily, um, what this is is just um, dedicated effort and time to working through the long tail of um, of issues, and so there. So are, could we make this more specific? Like so, so uh, there are there are some specific known issues. Um, like the installer. The, the installer is one. Um, Should be its own item, maybe. Yeah. Someone wants to add a road for that. Um, are there things? So 
package groups and BSD install. I mean, so we should split this out uh, as we're going here. Um, and okay. so, uh, B, you know, BSD install support for package base is should be one item that's on here as its own. What in the world happened there? <laughs> okay, there we go. It's fun watching it get edited in real time. And so, do you want to say anything about package groups and what that means? Um, I will. I will defer that to the uh, IRC uh, commenters. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Well, maybe they can update the file as we go. So Colin said we also need uh, package base um, as part of our release process. Um, I know. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. So that we ship release. I mean, this is kind of, yeah, these are all kind of tied together, but yes, it's good to have that as a separate line item. Ideally, we, we would kill this item by just having it be split out, yeah. honestly. So maybe if we can add a package groups and then maybe. Yeah, package groups should be its own item. Um, and I don't know if we want to call out a, uh, a separate entry for um, package base integration and testing, um, or that's just implied. Uh, okay, but. probably we can leave that implied. So, but these three things are better than the one that was there before. Yeah. Um, Alan, do you want to talk about this one at all? If it's still on your need list? Yeah, this is just to be able to make uh, jails in Poudreware that don't have a tool chain so that if you're building your own installer ISOs or a VM image or something, that you have the ability to do that even though the, the jail you're using to build it doesn't have a tool chain. Okay. Uh, kind of related to wanting to make it easier for people to build a custom release of, of FreeBSD and get more of the process closer to the way release engineering does it, uh, but with the kind of ease of customization that Pudra offers with its overlay support and pre-install these packages and, and so on that's very difficult to do with the regular make-release process. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next we have, this is something Brooks talked about last year, external toolchain support. Which I think means not supporting external tool chains, but moving our current tool chain to external. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I don't think we're. I don't. I don't think we're intending to like kick the tool chain out uh, for 15. Certainly, um, but uh, continuing to support things. I think we're. I mean, on Cherry, we don't use the internal tool chain at all. So, um, I think just continuing to. Make sure that works as a first class thing. Um, I guess there is there's a longer term need to understand how we bootstrap a tool chain to do a release in a way that's replicatable and sensible. Um, and you know, I know how we do it for Cherry BSD, but that's not probably how we would do it for the project. So we need some concept of, you know, where did the tool chain that builds the release come from? And that includes um, package, the whole thing, not the not the bootstrappy thing. <clears throat> so pre-commit CI, this is a, uh, <clears throat> a very probably a very broad thing that maybe needs to be split up. Um, like bricolet, I think is a have. Perhaps it exists. It's a have. It's not like a so. Probably that needs to be its own item with Mark. Um, make CI is is also kind of. I mean, that's part of it's in the tree. So I'm not even. But I'm, it's, maybe that's a have, or is it? A, I don't think it's quite completed. Who wants to speak to that one? Um, so make CI is not useful uh, for as it, in its current form without extra work for uh, vetting whether like a pull request is good. You, you need to do a few things to make it useful today. And I'm, you know, there, I'm sure others have, people have other problems with it as well, but that's where we are right now. So <clears throat> could I suggest a need is like uh, make CI improvements or like make CI <clears throat> feasible or not feasible, 
Yeah, this, this make CI improvements to aid with like merging external contributions. That's really long, but something like that as a line item. Yeah, there's there's we have like eight different things around pre-commit CI. I think they should each be their own line item. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to angle for. So I'm trying yeah. to how to like pre I have. I think saying something about make CI working better for merging PRs is a, is a, is a need, and that will be its own line item. Um, uh, and some of these other ones, it would be nice to split those out instead of kind of having a giant thing that you could ever check off. So I don't know if whoever added stuff, if you want to split some of these. Um, I know we've, we talked yesterday about uh, someone who has a project that gives you a, uh, it's a, a fork of GitHub's internal action runner stuff, and you can implement your own kind of runner backend so you can run actions locally as opposed to in GitHub's cloud. Um, that's probably its own item. <laughs> okay. All right, so I assume y'all are splitting this one up. Uh, who wants to talk, or does anyone want to talk about this next one, pre-commit CI with ports? And is that still a single thing, or does that also need to be somewhat split up? Yeah, I currently I'm not looking at it yet because I try to focus on source and ports and uh, source and the dock. And uh, uh, to my understand that uh, uh, Batiste has some uh, uh, thoughts about that, and uh, uh, Moin have some uh, proof of concept of that uh, based on uh, service CI. But I guess he doesn't update for a while. So uh, to be honest, the lot item isn't edited by me, but I can check with him uh, to have better uh, uh, <coughs> understanding about the, the status. Yeah. The, uh, one thing I did like to add is uh, for port CI, the major challenge is that uh, it usually needs to deal with uh, when a very deep dependency gets updated, that will cause uh, very, very many uh, packages needs to rebuild, and uh, that takes a lot of time and uh, computing resource. That's a major uh, issue needs to be solved by uh, 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 for for use really useful for CI. Uh, do you want to refine this, going back slightly, make CI useful for committers? Do you, do you want to be more explicit, like for committers to test a patch before pushing it? How do you, it's okay. Okay. So th there's two audiences for make CI. One is for committers who have made a change and want to test everything out automatically, um, maybe without having to build their own Jenkins install locally. Um, and then the, the other is um, using it, and maybe we need two different targets. Um, the other is using it for contributors outside the project who are contributing. Um, we can vet those contributions before we push them in, whether they come in via GitHub or pull requests or whatever. That's the, 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 the second thing. And I think those two use cases overlap 90-some percent. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what, that's why I have the two different things up there. Okay. And I'm only signing up really for the second one, but um, I think, you know, we need to coordinate, Lee Wynn and I and uh, Moen need to coordinate on uh, what's going where with this stuff uh, as well. Okay. I mean, I think for now, if we don't have a person who will at least will volunteer to answer questions about what it means, then we kind of need to probably take it off the list. But. <laughs> Okay, you want to, so Lee Wen and Greg. Greg, you were first, so how about you go? For the first item, uh, I and uh, Moin can take over land because uh, that part, that, the first item is part of Moin's uh, uh, foundation sponsored project. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, kind of general category is just 
AI support. So that could be uh, CUDA support in FreeBSD. That could be, well, included in that would also be, uh, you know, more complete support for DPUs um, in FreeBSD. Uh, and as far as owner, um, you know, I, I don't have a clear idea of that right now, but I, I would like... You can be the point of contact, at least. I can be the point of contact, for sure. If, if folks are interested in collaborating on those things to make sure that FreeBSD can support those workloads really well, um, you know, Ed and I are thinking about how we can facilitate that. Okay. My only thought on that is, do you qualify that as a need or a want? Like, how strong is it? Like, do you have a specific kind of vendors or customers in mind who need it? Yeah. Okay. So that presumably is uh, someone added to the bottom. Uh, well, just to the, to the end, it's like an append journal. Where were we at? Local and cloud developer CI. Okay. I think local and developer CI is kind of, is that the same as this one? Improving make CI? Okay, then maybe, maybe merge them. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, just take it off for now. That's because this is also just too vague. Like, I think it's helpful to have concrete things when we know when they're done. And that one's, we don't know when that one's done. Uh, all right. Kill it. All right. It's gone. It's problem solved. Ah, uh, I think I assume this is on IRC universal flash storage driver. Does anybody in the room want to say anything about this? Warner doesn't want to say, but he's raising his hand. <laughs> Warner has to say something. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, used for both uh, embedded systems and uh, the early boot on x86. So if you wanted to create a Linux boot image. For x86, you would need to put it inside of a UFS um, a driver, um, and it would also be useful to have it more generally for the system. I'm not entirely sure what loose what 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 this means to 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 him, but that's kind of the extra context around that that I can give. Okay. I'm going to punt to Mark about this <laughs> next one to see if he has any ideas just because I know you hack on D-Trace. D-Trace dash C works. <laughs> I used it like, I don't know, last week. Um, PR not submitted yet. Like pull request? And I think he means bug report is my guess. See many include, I'm not sure what that means. I wonder if it is it the thing where sometimes you can have stale things in like the like proc.d and so forth and it gets unhappy. Oh. I mean, that used to be when we ran out of types, which we've now fixed by bumping the size of the number of types we can have. But I, think, I wonder if it's something like that. I think I see that. So okay, so <laughs> dtrace actually has a kind of it has a like it can parse C declarations kind of. Yeah. So you can include C headers in your scripts. Right. and get constants. Um, and apparently there's problems with tight depths getting redeclared. That, oh yeah, because, oh okay, dash capital C is the thing that's like, yeah, run the preprocessor. Um, okay, I'll take a quick look at this. Okay, maybe we can just add uh, Mark J to the to the as a comma another person to the person field. Um, okay, does anybody want to talk about this item of refined BSC user support for release process? It's a QMU thing. Okay, we're on this side. We'll start on this side and we'll wander to then we'll make Ed walk all the way across the room. So a while back, I added some support. So the, let's wind back a bit. For BSD um, static user, you can tell the kernel that when I try to run this uh, um, 
ARM64 binary on my <coughs> x86 system. Use QMU instead, right? And there's a facility to store these, these mappings of ELF binary to helper. And I added, I implemented a concept which, which was uh, done in Linux first to allow the kernel to pre-open these emulators so that jails don't have to have the binary installed. The kernel already can access it because it's got an open vnode. Um, and that, using that required some changes to the um, QMU ports to stop it from kind of trying to work around me. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the s quite what the status is on the QMU side. The FreeBSD kernel support is has been there for a while. It could probably improve its support for jails. I know Colin wanted to isolate this behavior to a parent jail, and that requires some changes. But if you're okay with just what you do on the host is available to all my jails, then that it works there. Okay, so I'm wondering if we can split this up a little bit. So one of them, I guess, is playing nicer with jails or being having allowing jails to constrain it. Yeah, uh, just to elaborate a little bit, um, most of the release building process is just your standard cross-build of uh, FreeBSD image, uh, FreeBSD in, uh, build world, and so on. Um, but we do uh, need to run a, a couple things under emulation um, for building VM images. Sometimes we install packages which may have their own install scripts that they run. Um, we need to run uh, LD config to set up library stuff. So th there's just a, a few commands. It's like less than 1% of the build process, but we need to run a little bit under emulation. So I use QEMU for that. And there's just a couple oddities like on ARM64 we try to set up the the bits for 32-bit running 32-bit ARM binaries under ARM64 which QEMU gets confused by um, right but I and I'm currently running the old one so it's it's stuff that needs to be cleaned up between me and the people that know about QEMU but we'll, we'll get it sorted out okay I think this split sounds good. Are you happy with that one or do you want to say more? That's, that's, that's fine. Okay, Warner says he's happy. I'll talk. So the 32 on 64 um, is half committed <coughs> on the QMU side. Uh, it's committed to the new uh, stuff but not the old branch. Um, we need to update the old branch or kill it or something. And that's, Fire! We're yeah, that's that. proving to be difficult. <laughs> Um, the, uh, also yesterday, um, Mitch was saying that the, uh, package build is totally broken on risk 64, um, because of, uh, Poudrier issues, uh, with, uh, QMU and emulation and core dumps. And that's as far as I know. So that needs to be investigated and looked at and see if it's some trivial thing or some big massive undertaking or whatever. So that's that's why that's there. Yeah. So Gordon's question in response to you is that is that is that a need or a want? I'm not going to debate the fine ph philosophy of this. <laughs> it's something I might work on in the next year, maybe. Okay. So if somebody wants to move it, great. But it needs to be on the list. Uh, that's fine. Yes. Uh, there's two more here that have you. Uh, we've right, talked that, like that might be a the 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 runner for pull requests might be a want. Okay. Um, not a need. I'm happy with that. But the GitHub action um, for quality of experience is definitely a, a, an urgent need that I need help with, so that we can, as we get more pull requests, um, do more things automatically, like immediately tell the user, "Thank you for the contribution. Um, here's what's wrong with it," uh, so that. Uh, People don't have to do the initial triage that, that I'm doing right now. So, you know, stu stuff like that. And I, we need people that have experience and expertise in the area to work on that. I do hacky things occasionally, but I'd, I'd like some help with that. 
So, okay. So I I'll think coordinate it, but I'm not going to do the work on either one of those. All right, fair enough. I think for this one, um, I think the, the URL was posted in IRC yesterday, but there is a project Baptiste, I think we've talked about it, be pointed to as a, the thing that's a, a clone on GitHub of somebody who's re-implemented the GitHub runner API, and that's what allows you to run it locally. So it'd be nice to drop that URL on this item if someone can find it. Uh, so we've got a few minutes left before lunch. So maybe let's uh, still talk about need things. We can always do more need things after lunch if, when we come back. But are there other things that folks can think of that they believe they will need in the next, or, or for a product that's going to ship on 15.0. So the product might not be, or service or something until 2.0. And I want to call out one thing. I know you're coming up. Um, lots of times, th th this discussion really originated coming out of what are our downstream kind of appliance consumers need. Um, one of the things that happened in core this term um, is we had a bit more balance of more ports people in core. And so one of the things we found out is, is one of our internal discussions, um, I think it was Tobias who brought up and said, we really need iNotify. And that was something that had never kind of been voiced over to source world, for lack of a better way. So we would like to hear things that are not just, what do I need to make my embedded appliance work? Um, what do we need for things that will, and we know some of them are obvious, like Wi-Fi, it's not terrible. Um, but what are some things that we need for things like a better desktop experience that our ports folks are aware of that are a gaping hole they need some help from source to fill? So those are also things we'd like to hear, not just what do I need for my storage appliance. Um, I guess one fairly big thing for framework laptops is that uh, for the newer chips, they don't support S3 sleep states, and they only have the ah. SOIX. Yes. And, uh, FreeBSD doesn't support that yet, and I know a guy from Intel worked on that, um, but yeah, I think that kind of got abandoned. So uh, yeah, I think that should be a need. Yes, so S0IX, if it's not on here somewhere, should be on here. Uh, it's not on here yet. Um, yeah, it needs to be, it probably needs to be a need. Um, so whoever's adding that's S capital zero, then lowercase ix. Uh, it's, it's also the idea of doing it. I think the way, so the way the, the Ben from Intel worked on it and the way it was first implemented in Linux is they basically implemented a software S3. So they would just suspend the whole system. But really what you want to do, the mature thing, is you want to selectively figure out what things I can power down and only power up things on demand, which is what you really need for other platforms like ARM where you don't have a firmware giant knob to say, go to sleep. You have to kind of own the power states of all the things in your system. Uh, and, it, and we should throw I notify on the list, and you can put Tobias as a, a TC burner as a person who asked for it. But that should, that's a need that should be added. I'm wondering if I've gone stale again. Nope. Okay. Are there other ones? Well, those hopefully get added. S R I X and I notify. Um, are there other ones people can think of? We also actually. It is 11.59, <laughs> so why don't we pause where we're at now. Yeah, I'm, I, have the, I have them stuck in my head, so I'll make sure that the two ones get added. Um, why don't we go ahead and pause for lunch now. Uh, during lunch, you're free to kind of let your, the, your uh, juices flow. Well, I don't know how do I say this, not terribly. <laughs> that was not the right way to say this. Uh, <laughs> Have an opportunity for your brain to relax a little bit and think about other things you want to talk about when we come back. So when we come back, we'll, have, we'll start off with a little bit more of time if folks have need items, and then we'll move into the more uh, wish listy things of want. And then the last thing, the thing we have to talk about, it's lots of fun, fire and axes and things we remove from the tree and make sure we actually do some of these things, fire with fire. Um, so we will talk about that too. So think about not just things that... Uh, you like to have, but things that need to go because they have overstayed their welcome or just they're too old or whatever reason. So with that, I think we can probably resume talking about 15.0. Um, so let's see.
There's Ed. He gets to have the mic when he's ready. That's okay. I'll give you another minute or two. <laughs> um, so where were we on here? Oops, I have the mice in the right place, the mouse. I think we were at the end of need, is that correct? And this is stale now. Uh, I think it's being fixed. Uh, sure, I wasn't editing it. Okay, so this will be the last call for anything in the Need uh, correct. Um, anything in the need action before we move on to more wish listy things, and then get into the best part where we pull out the, the axes and apparently the F word that I can't say that's not that one um, in a building. So anything else that people have that is a kind of thing you really need, as opposed to something that's a wish list that would be nice and ponies and unicorns and fairy dust, or we can move on to ponies and fairy dust. That's an interesting question. Well, I, but, but, you, okay, well, let's, okay, well, we'll, we'll let's do this. So, yeah. do, do we need a strategy for OpenSSL or other upstreams as a need for 15? So, um, like, can you, you know, want to be, what do you want more concrete? Do you, for example, well, do we? So specifically for OpenSSL, right? The current yeah. version of OpenSSL 3.0 is deprecated as of 2026. That's the long term support version. There is no, version at this point that's longer term support. Supposedly, let's, let's imagine they come out with 3.4 and they're gonna say that's gonna be long term support. Right. And we'll need to move towards that for 15. Would be what my statement would be. From my desirements as the uh, security officer having to deal with it for four years. So I'll, I'll, I'll hear you, I'll, I'll ask you a question back. Okay. Um, I can't remember, uh, cause I think it's also changed since the last time I looked. Does OpenSSL have a stated policy of when they're going to decide a branch is LTS? Do they do no, an they even don't. odd thing? They just pull it out of their tush. <laughs> um, okay. Uh. Yeah. So, so it, it it could just well, and like I said, like it's funny too because OpenSSL 3.0 is going to be maintained longer than 3.1, 3.2. But they have not established a 3.3 policy yet. So. Maybe 3.3 will be the next build. So one question I have is, mm -hmm. would there be any, any reason, oh, I can think of some other reasons. What about, should we be tracking a newer OpenSSL in main, even if it's not in 14? That would be the question that I would say. That in particular, that. I know we've already pulled, Mark has done some, somebody else, they've pulled in like some of the optimized uh, uh, assembly routines for things like AVX 512 and other things that are only in 3.1. So we've already diverged. Mm -hmm with the crypto bits that we, like the assembly crypto bits that we use that are effectively from newer OpenSSL already. So it would kind of clean that up if we Yeah, it might be a good idea to do that too. Newer OpenSSL in main. We, yeah, we may want to track closer to head OpenSSL in main. Just yeah. For, so we're, um, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have the answer for this because there's no, no place that we can stake a claim. Maybe we can reach out to the OpenSSL folks and see what they're, if that might be useful to give mm -hmm. us some guidance about, yeah. like, I can do that only go this high, only, like, only go to 3.2 because you'll be happier than if you try to go, or 3.1 or, or it's, something if yeah, they yeah. were willing. I feel like they're not going to be willing to say anything useful, but if they would, that would be useful. Well, yeah, I mean, we can at least have a conversation with them, and if they say we don't have an answer, then that's at least an answer of no answer. But, <sighs> you know, but they may be like, we're thinking that 3.3 will be right. you know, the next LTS, in which case we should go ahead and start Getting to three two now three because two, that'll so make that it less painful. Yes. Yes. Now I do think that as time has gone on, and someone can correct me because I'm not the one who actually does the work, but the would uh, OpenSSL has actually done a decent job of making it less painful to upgrade now that we're past the couple of the versions. Well, a lot of the op like they've moved everything to being opaque already. They've moved a bunch of stuff, so like the, the yeah. API is, is more or less stable. Well, so I, I took a look uh, last week. Um, we still have bits in the tree that have the macro and C flags to say that we'll still use, we won't complain about things that were deprecated from 1.1 one that, that we well, use. Okay, yeah, we should probably fix um, that then. Well, yeah, so I went, to, I went to fix one, the KTLS test that I wrote a while back. Mm. Um, and they use what should be the generic EVP interface for doing like Macs. And it's really the Macs that are a pain. Um, apparently with ciphers, you can still call the built-in function to get back your like class for a cipher. Mm. But for Max, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to do something where you pass a string name of what it's supposed to be to get back a thing, and then you have to pass a string name of the type of Mac construction you want to do that you kind of layer and build up. 
It looks a little clumsier than actually the old thing. So uh, I looked at it and kind of sighed and sighed because that's. <laughs> but, I, don't know what to <laughs> I, I mean, we're stuck with it. But that yeah. one I looked at and I said, that one, a lot of the changes in one one, yes, it's a lot cleaner, opaque, yada. This one is more shuffling deck chairs or something. Yeah. But. Anyway, so that might be something we need to figure out. OK, but all right. What do we want to say? That's a good one to say. My guess is we do want to actually probably sooner than later start going to a newer 3.2. Um, related, we were talking during the break. Do you want to say anything about what we should do about a FIPS module? Or, or, or how? What, do we want to put that in a list somewhere? Is that a need? That's probably a want. Um, well, but is it a need that we should fix it? Yeah, that's probably true. We should stop shipping the FIPS module. Um, in Maine? Because the one that we ship is not in a validated FIPS module, and you can't actually use it for the purpose that it is intended. So we should probably stop shipping it. Now, that how that's going to work with, you know, getting a, probably putting a port together, that would be the properly validated version. Um, OK, yeah. yeah. Or, 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 or do OpenSSL FIPS more correctly, might yeah. be a way to, to state it. It yep. should be a port that's like the approved version, and we shouldn't build it as part of source. Yeah, because the that's summary. the gist of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I think over to Brooks. Yeah, I guess my I was reminded of the related issue of the deprecated SSL stuff. There's a portion of the build where it, if you build with dash s, make dash s, then there's a section of the build that is just spewing deprecation warnings. So it'd be nice if those went away. So, so I have a general want. I think this is a want. Um, I would be yeah, out there's wrong button. I would like make dash s to be less crap. Um, I know I, uh, there was a while we've done some uh, some newer versions of LVM and we'll add a warning that is really noisy and so we'll just make it nowhere for a while. And some of those I've managed to go kill. Um, <clears throat> I would like us to it's a good exercise to try to avoid having lots of no error warnings. Like either, either it is completely bogus and we just turn it off. But if it's, yeah, it's just tedious, at some point we should do some of the tedious bits and get it to where make minus s is not a complete trash fire. would be my personal desire. But that's definitely a want. <laughs> definitely not a need. <sighs> You're very weird people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least drop it there, yeah. Okay, any other needs? <laughs> I, I like this too. That's that's kind of cute. Um, any other needs? Or we'll, we'll we'll shift to want. It'd be a fine thing to do. Okay, so let's talk about. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I have oh. a question about the um, FIPS module in OpenSSL. Do you mean it's not validated because it's not uh, certified by some entity, or because okay? Because by default, it, uh, OpenSSL doesn't have the hash which authenticated. There's an entry in the handbook how to do that. And I was wondering when I was doing the integration if this should be shipped with uh, this fixed by default or not, or if this is what you mean. But no, you can't. Yeah. So, so FIPS has very specific procedures where you have to have the install generated on the machine that it's going to be running on. So we can't ship that. They need to, the needs to be done as part of the, the stand-up process for it. So that, and then additionally, the FIPS module is only validated on certain versions, like 309 is the validated version. You can use it with 3012, I think, is what we shipped to 14.0, but you have to use the, you have to mix it. So it's it kind of a weird procedure. <coughs> OK, so let's shift to um, unicorns and fairy dust and ponies. Um, so I already mentioned make minus s. So let's go th things that are on here to see if they should stay on here or if people are still interested in them. Um, TPM support, I don't think that I've seen this fly by as in review or anything, but I assume this is for storing the key that you would use with Jelly or ZFS for. And you're, you're still interested in this? OK. Any, any update on like a chance of making progress or anything or a timeline? OK, fair enough. Um, is this very closely related to the next one? I guess we're used to, OK. OK. Anything else you want to say about it? 
Oh yeah, sorry. So we should we should make sure Alan <laughs> actually get everything on the stream that you said. Right. So for the TPM support, uh, it's mostly still something that we want, and there's not really been any progress yet. Uh, but ZFS encrypted boot support. So this is if you're using ZFS's built-in encryption rather than Gelly. Uh, getting that support into our bootloader is on our list of stuff. And Tumas has the start of some. He's done the investigation and and has an idea of what's required. Likely this will only be supported in the EFI bootloader because there's just not enough room in the, the legacy one and <laughs> you shouldn't be booting legacy anymore anyway. Uh, but yes, that one we actually expect to make progress on uh, before the end of this year. Okay. Uh, this is an Ed and I don't think John, well John's at the conference, I don't know if he's here today. Oh yes, okay. But I think we know what this is, which is that our current SMVFS entry kernel VFS thing is only very ancient versions that no one should use. <laughs> um, I, I got as far as a, a user LAN, um, I can't find the word. Like I've, I've got a, a simple implementation in user LAN and it runs on Fuse. Uh, the next step is to dump it in the kernel, and I ran out of time. That's that's it. That's where I'm at. Okay. And uh, John, there are some discussions ongoing on other possible implementations to replace our in kernel one, uh, but no progress uh, to be able to report. And Brooks wants to add a comment as well. I mean, I think from our use in Cherry, uh, nine PFS would would do the job for us. Oh uh, um, yes. I guess I would say that possibly probably should go to want. Um, is my understanding is everyone's abandoning nine PFS in place of Bird IOFS? So. Yeah. <coughs> Yay. Didn't we move this one up to have or something? Yeah. So we took it for nine PFS. Yeah, there it is. So, um, Brooks, there's a gentleman who's written um, a vert IO FS um, implementation and a whole vert uh, star testing infrastructure and two or three other things that uh, uh, is going well. He and Alan are working together, Alan Summers, um, on that. And I somehow got CC'd, and I'm happy about that because I get to see the progress and I don't have to do any work. <laughs> uh, what did you what okay i'll make sure i'll make sure jessica knows about it that, that was a comment from brooks okay so um this one is now a duplicate so we could x this one i think it's supplanted hmm? no this is the same code dfr has the, the cleaned up version of this mike coming over Right. So the situation, there was a code drop from Juniper a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Various people made fixes and things for it. I wanted to use it um, as a root file system, and it really didn't work. So I put made a bunch of changes, some of them gratuitous, like renaming things to avoid conflicting with VertIOFS as a name. Um, and that's that's the thing which is in review in the have part. Right. Since then, more work has happened inside of Ju Juniper, which is <laughs> not unexpected, and it would be nice to sync up with their changes to make sure that we don't lose something along the way. I don't know that we need two items in the list, though. No, no. <laughs> I just need to talk to the Juniper guy. Okay. But maybe we could add a note or something of sync up with Juniper to the one and have. Uh, okay, we talked about, or Warner talked about VertIOFS. Someone else is working with Alan. Uh, who wants to talk about, I feel like this is more of a Brooks want, or is this even becoming a need? Or is this also the thing that's happening in um, the GSOC project, right? Okay, so, okay. Is that an in progress thing technically then, sort of? Or we don't want to move it there yet? Okay.
OK, so Warner was saying that there, this is in progress in GSOC, and we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Um, streamlined installer, which we talked about yesterday in some context, didn't we? This says you, Ed. So what do you want to say? Is it just still, is this, is it at some point become a need? Um, I, I mean, I think um, there's, there is definitely uh, a need slash want from um, various downstreams who are consuming FreeBSD and trying to bring new people up uh, on FreeBSD for the first time. Yep. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think the, um, there's a lot of different installer projects uh, or different interest uh, in the installer from various places. Um, I think some of this might uh, follow on from um, what Pierre started with the graphical installer. I mean, it's not related to graphical installer mm -hmm. per se, but um, but installer work, I think, as a, as a whole will uh, be something that we're looking at. Just I know uh, Jessica did some changes to make network configuration be more of a fewer things that I think get prompted by default yeah. or something along those lines. Do we want to split this one up at all? Like, do you want to say something about for a single disk, it should be one click instead of in? I mean, do, do you want to make this more concrete? Or I guess it's fine if a wish list is a little more vague, but. Yeah. OK, that one's probably. Um, so Doug's right over there. <laughs> so um, Alan tells me this was um, a holdover from last year. The, the, um, Where did it go? Oh, it oh OK, it's dead. OK, so um, <laughs> I added support for mounting regular files. Um, since then, people have asked for sockets and maybe FIFOs, uh, which I haven't done. And I don't think there's any problems with doing that. But I was being conservative at the time. I only allow for regu regular files. And OK. Did that get merged, by the way? Yeah, it's in. It okay, was so it should into be 14 a current and merged and backported ah. to 13. Okay. Well, if someone could tag the commit in there, that would be handy. Yes. I couldn't give you the commit hash off the top of my head. Oh, no. Someone can find it. Git log is a thing, and there's lots of us hacking on the document. Uh, where were we then? We were at more container support, um, which I think we can probably change uh, me to DFR there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We probably want a little more concrete, don't we? <laughs> it, well, it would be nice to have a co-op student to do stuff. I mean, <laughs> I, I, there's there's an unbounded amount of work here, um, and I'd love to have more people get involved in doing stuff. I'd like somebody to start um, making, like, own, owning the container deport and making it do more things. That's kind of stalled, and I, I want to not have Podman be the only solution here. I think it's container D port. Container D. Yeah. 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 Um, um, also, do you want to put here like um, official images or official registry for images and things like that? Official images, um, a distribution mechanism that makes sense for those. Um, whether it's putting them in our GitHub namespace or whether it's running our own registry, I don't mind, as long as we have something. OK. I think we can um, basically just uh, import Doug's uh, talk from yesterday by reference for the, uh, <laughs> the, the topics here. Yeah, just, just put a link. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to say anything? Still in progress. OK. Warner says still in progress. Because <clears throat> I want to have time for adding stuff if we need to do. Who wants to talk about ye? I want to talk about this one. Okay, I shouldn't have stopped you. And feel f free to add folks. Also, if somebody can keep an eye on like IRC and interrupt me or wave at me if somebody says something, that would be handy. So there's uh, three or four things that are on the list. So I'll talk about them just very briefly in order. Um, the bootloader needs to support dev match in order for us to have a good uh, kernel stuff. And Manu has uh, done that for FTT. We need somebody to do it for PCI um, and maybe USB. But you don't need USB to boot, usually. <coughs> um, rewrite config in Lua, that's a crazy notion that uh, Kyle and I have had. Um, 
our current config is barely adequate most days unless you look at it too hard. Um, <laughs> so um, if somebody wants to help out with that, that'd be great. Kyle and I don't have a lot of time for that. Um, Merv de merge devmatch and devd. Um, this was one notion to get around the flood of matching issues at mm -hmm. boot. Um, Colin has another notion, but I've got uh, dev match turned into a C++ class and kind of partially integrated with um, devd. And it looks like uh, Mina is willing to help, but I haven't talked to her about that uh, yet. So. Um, this is basically uh, an optimization, particularly at runtime, when you plug a lot of things in, it'll go faster. So, before we go to the next one, um, on the topic of Lua, <clears throat> something Mark mentioned yesterday during your talk. Do we want an item somewhere? Um, I'm not sure which class you want to put it in about. Um, making Flua more featureful by adding some kind of more libraries, something like the Lua post you mentioned, or something that has more bindings that we ship to make writing things in Lua less painful. Yeah, I think we want like a previous space in Lua. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just, it came up. It sounded like a good thing <clears throat> that should be on the list. Excuse me. All right. Uh, do you want to talk about this? <laughs> yeah, I'm quite interested in scheduler things, and I'm currently hands down in it, so. I thought that uh, with that, that line, I, I think that other people are interested. And I think I th saw a comment uh, in the past few weeks about um, grabbing more information uh, from the cores themselves about how a program performs on them. So I'm not sure. So I, I, I guess some other people That was people Constantine, are... I think. Sorry? Was that Kib, I think? Or somebody else? Okay. I don't think so. I'll have to look it up. But I think that some other people may be interested there. Oh. Carl's is interested in it, so. Yeah, made a list of interest. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Ah, actually, I'll ask Mitchell if he wants to talk about this one. He's been writing a lot of man pages and updates to man pages. Yeah, let's talk about man pages in general. Well, let's start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I'll start with this the second item here, the the audit. So, essentially. You know, in the last year or so, I've taken a look at kind of what exists in in our Section Nine man pages, and like done it up in a little spreadsheet of you know what's the last modified date, and uh, <laughs> you know I was able to kind of attack some of the low hanging fruit and bring a few pages into this millennium. Um, including the the intro page, which was really like it was it was a bad look for that one to have been written as a one off thing and in like 1996, yeah. which is before I was born. <laughs> um, so now it is now the intro page is like kind of a, a map of what exists and it and it's like a little bit messy because that's just kind of what we have. Um, but essentially I'd like to kind of publish in some form the, the, my investigation into this, um, just so we know a little bit like what kind of areas are covered by documentation and what's kind of really outdated. And I think the two kind of biggest core pieces of functionality that are really outdated being the scheduler pages are totally obsolete and the VFS documentation is really big and wide and um, inconsistently up to date. So um, a lot of it is like 
halfway correct, but you know, maybe it's 10 years ago or more. Um, so there's a lot of work needed on those and, you know, they're, they're in the want category because, you know, yeah, it, it's kernel docs. Um, but it, you know, I guess in general, I'm I'm interested in this uh, improving this area at like, especially uh, removing the weeds, so to speak. So, if there are particular pages in section nine that you're wanting or that you have problems with, like I'm interested in that kind of feedback. Okay, um, Ed, what is your comment about man pages in general? Or other man page topics besides nine. Oh, no, I'm just I'm just saying that we can talk about man pages. So. Ah, okay. Um, I don't want to talk about the next one. <laughs> It'll happen someday. It kind of mostly doesn't matter because the things that are under giant don't matter. Um, Maybe we should uh, have some documentation about uh, giant that uh, confirms that. <laughs> A, a giant said, a, a I, don't, I can't say French words. Um, to rename it to something else. Gion. <laughs> I would want to say, what is it? What's the French word for tiny? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking of having an April Fool's Day post that we've renamed giant to tiny. <laughs> the only thing that's really under giant that matters is uh, new bus. Everything else is the TTY driver. And once we get new bus out from under it, we could just rename giant to TTY lock. Yeah, just pretty much. Especially if we could remove the weird semantics too while we're at it. Okay, um, maybe someday. Uh, I think this is from last year. So I'm gonna look at Lee Wynn to say, do you have any thoughts on this item? Or an update? Uh, as, I, as I remember, uh, the current code needs to rebase and uh, cannot apply for the latest uh, uh, current branch. And uh, uh, one blocking issue is that there is still no suitable and uh, license compatible uh, funds available. So that would be the major issue. And uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, the last student, he's purchasing a PhD uh, uh, later this year, but there is another one uh, who thinks interested in this and uh, might pick up after uh, 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 after reading that code, uh, understand it better. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's still a work in progress. Okay. Is anybody else interested in Tarfus, or is it only Warner interested in Tarfus? I feel like some people are interested in Tarfus. I feel like it can't be only Warner. Yeah. Your name is on here, Warner, for Tarfus yes. root. Yeah, because you know, we don't want to file system to I have it on here because we don't need another file system to do an NetRD. Um, and Linux has done its an NetRD as a CPIO archive for. 30 years now. So it's just something that I would like. OK. That's why it's under want and not need or have. I also put does as a name next to it. There's not an update, I guess. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. No, there, there we go. go. Now it is. I'm going to look at Alan about this next one. Oh, I'm going to look at Alan and Doug together <coughs> and see if they have anything to say about OverlayFS. So the original requirement we're looking at here is specific to TARFS. So okay. if you're using TARFS to provide packages or, or additional capabilities on an appliance, being able to mount a whole bunch of TAR FSs onto like user bin and have all of the stuff show up. 
So many layers of tarfs's with one writable UFS on top. So not specifically overlayFS, but a way to overlay a bunch of tarfs's with one UFS for an appliance or whatever. Um, that was our use case, but we were interested if people had more general use cases of how we could try to solve them all one way instead of ending up with three different ways of doing it. So my use case is, so I, I use the FS for, for building container, um, or rendering container images, like applying all the layers. Um, the, the most, this is not great if you don't have ZFS on your machine, because the only, uh, the only alternative driver is just doing wholesale copies, and it's really slow. I think Union FS is going to solve my problem, but this is p potentially a viable approach as well. Okay. We have a comment on the other side of the room here, <coughs> uh, John. Go for it. Yeah, I wonder how would we handle the whiteout files if we want to use TATFS in the container uh, scenario? Because uh, container overlay uh, is not just a bunch of CPL archive, it's also the whiteout files. And they're like white out files to white out one file, but they're also white out files to white out entire directory. And do we need to want to follow the uh, OCI standard in terms of like handling? Here, I run the mic again. We do need two mics next year. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, whiteout is an important thing. Um, I think the Linux overlay FS driver has, so you've got the, the lower data set, the upper data set, and I think they have a, a third data set where they store, where I believe they might store the metadata, but I might have this all wrong because I haven't read the code. But basically they, they, they separate the whiteout from the underlying file system, which is different from union FS, which relies on have, being able to mark a file as whiteout. We need some solution for it. It needs to work um, efficiently for deleting directories as well. I don't know where Union F FS is for now. Yeah, I'm not sure what they do for directories specifically, uh, but for general files to wipe them out, the, the way they seem to handle it on Linux is they actually create a device file with a major minor number of zero, and that magically means whiteout. Uh, That's, I think, a different one. Um, and the advantage to that mechanism is that the file system doesn't have to support a specific like inode type of whiteout, like UFS does, but ZFS does not. Uh, and so that maybe is a, a way forward, but I don't know what you do for directories in that case. So, so yes, on, on Linux, you're right. It's uh, currently it's a special device file standing for uh, whiteouts. Uh, for directories, they have uh, they use extended attributes, and uh, they have a NOPAC uh, extended attribute for that. Um, and so, for, for yeah, it's true that for UFS, there is special support. Uh, I think I was kind of just starting discussion with Rob on how to uh, implement that for ZFS, for example. Um, I don't know if it's in your use case, if it's something that you want to require or you want it to work without that or I need to be able to build an image layer that deletes a file in the parent layer and have it work I, uh, how it how it works is not not as important <coughs> okay so the next ones are Definitely some fairy dust. Um, and Brooks is staring intently at his screen. <laughs> um, unless anybody else wants to talk about rust in somewhere in the system. I mean, I think at the moment there's not a lot of broad interest. Um, we don't have a specific application. If we had one, we should do something. Um, my, I continue to worry that we're going to end up in a state where some kernel framework we have to use gets written in Rust. And then suddenly we're going to have a panic. Um, so 
It'd be nice if someone chased something, but I don't think there's any specific target or any specific deadline. Um, I think this is uh, one thing I think this sort of venue is really useful for, though, is, is um, asking for feedback from our downstream consumers as well. Um, and so definitely interested in knowing what sort of um, use of uh, Rust in kernel or user land um, people building products derived from FreeBSD um, are, uh, are, or see a need for it and when. Harden BSD definitely is interested in, in supporting Rust at, at the very least in the user land, but would love also supporting the kernel. Um, we would uh, definitely be your guinea pigs for that, um, our community would be. Uh, and we would probably port some of our own applications to Rust as well. Uh. Run, run. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll trade in a little bit. There's a huge amount of support for Rust and uh, uh, on Amazon and EC2, uh, as well as services. So, I mean, we, we see this tremendously. There's a lot of transition for projects from like EFS uh, transition from S tunnel to what they to an EFS proxy that's written in Rust, and that is going to land somewhere and need to be recompiled as a pack. You know, for a package, it's an open source project. Should be should be in the you know available uh, directly for for users and lots of projects are going in that direction moving away from things yeah. in particular yeah yes well no, I think I think I might have misunderstood, but but I think that there's there's just generally there's there's a, there's a definite need for that, and I think that yeah. it's going to be more and more of the component parts that are there uh, that you're going to see coming in from say Annapurna Labs, things like that. Right? Yeah, I, what what I'm expecting is that yeah, things like um, cluster man you know, service management and stuff. Um, those are things we already install as packages. So like the fact that they move to Rust doesn't change a lot for us, which is good. Uh, the question is, when do we get something that needs to be in the base system or that we want to be in the base system? And now we have to do a bunch of work to integrate Rust. And that's, you know, that's where I'm hoping somebody like Harden BSD will blaze that trail so we can figure out how it's going to work. Because, um, you know, I think I haven't been following super closely, but like in the Linux community, there was some big excitement. And then there was some big, oh, that's complicated. Um, and, you know, we need to hit, we need to start understanding where those spots are in the kernel space and, and whatnot. Yeah, and I'm living through that immediately, which is that, which is that we have a lot of these, we have a lot of these th tools, but then determining where, where the, the actual support is, you know, which versions, what, what, wh you know, which ones are in the, yeah. in, in, in the the the, uh, the system itself, those are the those are the greater concerns and complications. So definitely, definitely want to keep that conversation alive. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 biggest issue, like just on a technical standpoint, is that um yeah. So even though Rust has a concept called additions, which are more akin to your C or C plus plus, you know, your your standards, so so to speak. Um, the even though there is really one big Rust toolchain implementation out there, even they just release, they, they release too often, at least for our base system cadence. So it's like, just because of that, um, there's going to there's gonna have to be a lot of reckoning outside of us, outside of really any, uh, any operating system community. Like, it really has to be a reckoning within the greater Rust community as to, like, Hey, like you know, there are some operating system, you know, you know, integration thoughts, but this rapid release thing is just not going to cut it. It's especially if there's like, you know, if you got to support 
you know, longer, you know, do some more longer term support sort of deals like how we kind of do things with our releases. I'm sure there are other operating system vendors and, and projects out there that need to that have those considerations. So, yeah, I mean, we could probably, I think at this rate or at this point, if we're going to really make any inroads on something like this, we would have to just integrate ourselves within the greater Rust community and just figure out, just like kind of make it known that this rapid release, that they're going to have to figure out something other than a rapid release, really. <clears throat> okay. So next, there's more interest in Netlink things. Um, Alan, do you want to say anything here? Or Rob? No, um, so right now, for fault management and just uh, notifications about things that happen in ZFS, uh, on FreeBSD, that those events get fed through DevD and then consumed by ZFSD, uh, whereas on Linux, they have Z or the ZFS event daemon. Uh, which is a very, very minimal port of what Solaris did. Um, and so both of those are very different. And for example, when we added the ability for you to configure, if you get more than this many slow IOs from a disk, let's replace it with a spare so you don't drag the performance of your whole pool down. We had to do that for Zed and then separately, um, Alan Summers and somebody else, uh, Alec Pinchek, did the implementation of ZFSD. Uh, and so every time we add something, we have to do it in two different code bases that are not even written in the same language. Um, and that's really annoying. And just kind of relatedly to BAP's next item, DevD, there's only one thing can consume that socket. With the Netlink system, you can have multiple consumers that can uh, apply filters of what events they would like to see. Uh, and so that would allow much richer event management and just people, in addition to using ZFSD or whatever we replace it with, also be able to consume the events in a different way for their monitoring system or whatever. Uh, and so we'll be doing this work mostly on the Linux side, but we will also make it, you know, the fact that it's we write it once and it'll work on FreeBSD and Linux will be a, a big win there, I think, and make sure that the fault management on FreeBSD keeps up uh, for free. Well, I think DevD's model is that it assumes the multiplex happens in user space rather than the kernel. Is that a fair statement, Warner? That the design was that you, the kernel would still emit one stream and it was up to user space to kind of mux it to multiple clients? OK. Okay, well, in particular, having one place instead of two. Uh, I'm looking at Alan because Mina's not here. Um, but you could also say, I don't know, I, I don't have so more thoughts. Many years ago, I started working on converting login.conf to UCL, mostly because at the time I was overriding a few of the defaults and it made it annoying to keep the file up to date across all the versions of FreeBSD that we were deploying. And so being able to have an include file that had my local modifications was an advantage. So I wrote a patch. You can tell from the review number that that was like yeah. seven or eight years ago now. <laughs> uh, never quite got finished. It would be great if someone finished it. And if we could adopt UCL for the config files of like everything in slash ETC really. Uh, just because we gain the ability to have those include directives and so on. And the fact that right now we do, like, I also had a, a diff to do this for a new syslog, but that got done differently. And while it's great to have them, the fact that it's kind of piecemeal really makes it harder to deal with, I just want to configure my whole system one way. Does anybody <coughs> have any thoughts about the next item, which is Libxo for more tools, networking tools in particular? Uh, do we want to? Hmm. In the past, we've annotated items when we didn't get an update, like with a double 
exclamation point or something. I wonder if we want to do that again. Um, okay. So um, IF config. At the moment, to get to get IP addresses from for containers in for in Cryo, in particular, um, I'm used parsing the output from IF config. This is brittle. Yes. Um, but I could get this. I put an, uh, uh, another um, item at the end um, about netlink into a jail, and that would get me what I need as well. So, but yeah, IF config is the is the standout here, and I don't know how you would go about converting that to libxo. It's too wild. In some cases, I've wondered if, like, my thoughts on PCI comp, for example, are that I think for structured data, you, I would think that for things that are structured, you sometimes you want to just have an entirely different path that is just generating structured data in a structured form. And instead of trying to interleave it with the human readable sometimes. Uh-oh, Warner is coming down. No reason yet. No, no. <laughs> wow, well, that's so, <laughs> that's not at all intimidating. All right, uh, I don't think Either of these individuals are here either. If anybody sees anything pop up on IRC, let me know, but I'll keep going. Uh, I feel like GVE landed in the tree. Is this true? Uh, GV, GVE is in the tree. Um, Luen, do you want to comment on this since your name's on it? Um, the, <laughs> the item here says ARM64 support for GVE. Which I feel like is in the tree. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it, as Ed says, uh, uh, MD GVE is in a tree, and uh, but currently only works for MD sixty four, not okay. on sixty four. Okay. But th this is probably more bug fixing than any like a uh, major function. Well, but yeah, but it, yes, but not something that exists yet. Right. Uh, okay, so we got three more here. Oops. Added more. Um, remove Mac label limitations. Whoa, why did it scroll so much? It's my deleted some things. Oh, there's Doug's new one. Not like access to a gel vnet. Oh, just wanted to delete the one below this, I guess. Um, this one was an Allen one, and then your name got taken off? You and Des? Deleted a couple of rows. Accidentally, maybe? Uh, so when we were reviewing Baptiste's new Mac do stuff. Uh, it came up that when we've done other stuff with Mac in the past, the, the concept of labels in Mac are statically allocated specifically to avoid dynamically allocating stuff at runtime. But that means that you have a very limited number of them. I think like four. Yeah, there's four. Uh, and so even if you just load and unload Mac modules a couple of times, you're now out and your only solution is to reboot if you want to change the configuration. Um, is it possible to use something like what BAP did there with uh, Pavel's OSD framework to allocate the memory but tied to a specific object so that it would have its lifetime tied to the module it's associated with to solve these problems? And if we're going to continue to do more and more things with the Mac framework, which I think we should, uh, can we solve some of these fundamental limitations to make it much easier to have configuration and state uh, live but in a way that isn't harmful to performance? Hmm. Okay. Maybe you do you want to restore the commentary because I think it, yeah. what you had there was before. Well, the one benefit is that this was streamed, or is streamed. So somewhere on YouTube, there is a screenshot right before it all went wonky. Uh, it does. It's not. It's only. It's so granular. Roll back and then. Pid namespaces for jails. Pid namespaces for jails. Okay. Ah, thank you. There we go. Okay. All right, does anyone want to talk about the PID namespaces for jails then? Pavel does. <laughs> 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 
Which which other names is this? Not sure why me, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so currently uh, mm, with the image, uh, we can have like separate network stacks per jail. But uh, for other namespaces like PID namespace or mouth namespace or others, uh, everything is shared between the host and the jails. So one, uh, so apart from like security problems, <laughs> there is also a problem with uh, scalability. So for example, uh, we have a system which runs over a hundred jails uh, with uh, each uh, having our product and uh, we end up in something like uh, 13,000 processes and then uh, the global uh, locks that protect uh, uh, process list are really uh, congested and uh, uh, and everything slows down uh, heavily. So there is like this limit, like 13,000 processes on this particular machine. So being able to uh, hide all those uh, PIDs uh, on separate lists, per jail lists, uh, would of course help with scalability, uh, but would also allow us to have in it in each jail. Uh, but then uh, we need to figure out, I think it also will help with like scheduling and uh, resource management. So uh, it doesn't matter if the jail have a thousand processes or two processes inside, we could uh, try to apply the same amount of uh, CPU time for each jail. But of course that uh, uh, if we still want to be able to uh, address individual processes inside the jail from outside of the jail, which people like Dax wants to do, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then, uh, then we need some, uh, some, some work to be able to do that. So for example, we need a version of kill system call where you can provide a jail ID and PID inside this jail, or actually you should also be able to like send a signal to nested jail, so that's even more complicated, so uh, stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something that would be really nice to have. Okay, so, so I have one must have here. Um, I need to be able to, to wait PID for uh, the, the process that I started within the, within the jail. Wait PID. Yeah, so the, the way OCI containers lifetimes work is they're bound to the lifetime of the first process that was put into the container, right? And un it's it's not it's not something we can do to to change this model. W we can't tell Linux the Linux world that we OCI is wrong. You have to start again. That's not going to happen. So we have to be able to work with that. And right now, because we don't have jail names, jail PID namespaces, they're just a redacted view of the host. This all works. I can I know what the container PID is. I can get SIG child signals for it, I can do wait PID on it, and all of the tools work. I didn't have to change a thing. I need that to be preserved in some way. And nice to have would be <coughs> to, to be able to, to poke at <coughs> the individual processes within the jail, like as a sysmat says, I've been a, that thing's gone wrong and want to kill it. But the first part is non-optional non for me. <coughs> So in particular, it sounds like, just as Pavel's mentioning, kill and some other things, having a way where you take a namespace ID as well, like a tuple, effectively, you might have to have a way to wait on a tuple. I also need a unique identifier. I, I need a, a, a unique numeric identifier for the container right. um, itself, which is, right now, it's the container PID, and that's how it works ah. everywhere else. You can't use the jail ID? Oh, that probably could be fixed. I 
guess so. Especially with weight ID, we should we could. There's a lot of assumptions in the code base that you can take the container PID and right. and test it. Like if I kill zero to see whether it's still there. Yeah, yeah. Or wait or wait on it to to get its exit code. I need to be able to get exit codes from the the mm -hmm. container process as it exits, things like that. They're starting work on that. So I'm going to talk about P Linux. It's Linux, the way Linux does PID namespaces, and this kind of breaks the thing that Pavel wants, is that if you have a a container inside a PID namespace, within the namespace within the within the container, you see a local view like PID one or whatever. But inside the kernel, each process has two PIDs, <laughs> or, or two or more PIDs. Ah. It has the container PID, it has the host PID. If it's nested, you have the, the child nesting PID, the, <laughs> the middle PID, and the host PID. Uh, I think you can have up to 32 levels, right? And so there's always a, con there's always a host PID for everything. Everything in the container, and and, um, and that's that's the way they do things. Did you want to say something yeah. about this topic? Sorry. Um, well, first, <laughs> just a little comment on that last bit. So much for not exhausting the uh, PID s size, but. Uh, I've got some work starting on jail descriptors, which means that, yes, you could wait on a jail. I would also like to see a slight change in process descriptors. Right now, the only way to get a process descriptor is to fork into one, and when you close it, it dies. I'd like to see a more of a view process descriptor, where you can get a descriptor for a process, and then you can wait on it and things like that without having to own the process and kill it. Uh, both of those you know, one in a descriptor way, and then, yes, you can pass descriptors anywhere you want between processes and controlling demons and the like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All I'm saying is that the this this assumption is is built into the the entire ecosystem of tool chains, and we could probably we could probably make this work, but it would be a lot of change for upstream, and there'd be a lot of pushback from upstream for about making this core part of their system more difficult for them to maintain. Uh oh. I think we lost a new line or something. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. Woohoo. All right. So we've got a half hour left. Um, so I, uh, I think. Well, SCG is a want, but Simon's not here to say what it is. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's move on to burning the burning things down. Um, are there? <laughs> okay. Okay. Last one. So we got to burn things. Right, right now we <coughs> we can uh, we've got a dash j um, argument to a lot of the tools so that we can do things to a jails vnet from outside, and the way that works is it like say if config will fork jail attach and do the operation. Um, if there's nothing running in the jail, that's safe, I guess. Um, but it's a bit clumsy. The way that um, things work, if you've got Netlink, you can, like with Netlink and network namespaces, you can get a Netlink socket inside the network namespace, and then mm -hmm. do Netlink link things to do, s do stuff. And that, um, that makes the initial configuration easier and slightly more efficient, but it allows for safe access to metrics. So I can get 
socket metrics without forking, without pushing uh, an instance of uh, netstat into the jail and getting the stats because in a, a malicious jail could then attack. I, I think this is far-fetched, but it's a possibility. Okay. So, um, I guess the first pass is, are there things that, on the list of things to burn down that we don't want to burn down? Um, I'm assuming if it's otherwise, we'll just say that yes, we're going to burn it down unless you have a question. Uh, so yeah, we don't need to get too, we don't need to get too technical. These, I think, uh, so there is a question here. So we have this thing that we're kind of thinking of doing of um, 32 at platforms and 15 mostly going away. And I guess this is a this is not really about I386, but of the platforms we're planning to deprecate for 15, when do we want to do the actual kind of axe chopping? So. I will give my opinion maybe and then open it from there. Uh, because we still have to keep the darn things around in 14, I'm kind of inclined to wait till we get pretty close to 15.0 before we actually start felling trees because then it gets harder to backport fixes perhaps. But I'm open to other thoughts. Okay. I have thoughts. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. I'll keep it brief though, maybe. Um, ARMv6, we should kill right away. I386 kernel, later is fine. 16 bit power PC, we should kill right away. 16 bit. Yeah. Sorry, 32 bit. <laughs> 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 um, PS3, we should kill right away, unless we're also going to kill uh, power PC entirely in this uh, release. Um, I linked a bug there that has been going on for months. Um, when I tried to do the PS3 stuff, everybody has a PS3 in the closet that used to run FreeBSD, but maybe I'll get it out and test it for you if you ask nice. That's the level of support for that. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'd like to say, maybe we just kill it all in uh, in this in 15. I guess I will tell Matt I completely broke PowerPC, all, all of them, for three weeks. Like, nothing worked because you couldn't make system calls. Hmm. I'll mention that I use FireWire for kernel debugging still. Yeah. So, so we won't kill FireWire yet, maybe next year, before 15. I, I would say that Nowadays, my preference for something like the access you get with FireWire um, would be either USB 3 debug or even better, uh, in my opinion, is using VMs because you can run a GDB stub on the hypervisor itself and you can break and control a kernel, even one that doesn't want to be cooperative. So even if you're spinning with interrupts disabled, you can still break and poke at the darn thing if you're using a GDB stub that's in the hypervisor itself as opposed to in the guest OS. And that, that level of control you can't get over FireWire. FireWire just gives you kind of a really nice memory dump, which you can also get from a hypervisor pretty easy. Oh, it also works with QMU if you're doing cross debug. That's not super fast, but it does work. But we, we, we do need something for actual physical hardware debug. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think. I think the, the answer is for us to invest in USB debug um, as the replacement for the cases where FireWire actually provides something you can't do through VMs today. That's my suggestion. I would agree with that. In particular, it seems like USB 3 debug is not crippled universally the way it, it was on USB 2. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in regards to PowerPC64, um, my one thought about that is there are there is some open reviews I'm aware of from folks at Raptor Engineering, and I I'm, I I need to I want to ask them who they're doing it for. Basically, but uh, but uh, if you. I, I will say that like PowerPC 64 has caught some things that until we get to ch 
cher till we get cherry in the tree, we wouldn't have caught. Um, so, like, it is giving us a bit of value. I worry it is a bit too. It's not as weird as Spark or Mips was, but it's it's got some places where it's gratuitously weird. Um, and I feel like the people who care about it need to like fix the fact that there are PowerPC specific conditionals in libc's make file. Like that needs to go away or the platform needs to go away because it required more thought than it has users. <laughs> just just this bug report on the right though, that's that's referring to thirty two bit power PC platform, isn't it? No, it's just the four bit Oh really? Power Mac G five is G five was sixty four bit. Oh okay. G four was thirty two. It was like the XServe servers you could get and so forth. Well, uh, yeah. Well, this may not be a good justification. I, I, for hardware that's real well, so, um, well, so, I will say, for example, we have a we've had a recent thread about um, uh, hardware for PowerPC that we, the current hardware that we have access to has not booted successfully like in the cluster for, I don't know if it's an order of months or years. Definitely many months that, that, that panics on boot and doesn't work. That the, the two machines that we have is my understanding. Um, and so our cluster atom team is nervous about adopting new hardware if the existing hardware is something that does not reliably work and they can't get anybody to fix for months on end. That 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 kind of meets the bar of it of not feeling very well supported. Supposedly, with this so this bug report that I'm reading, just like thumbing through, says my G, my only G5 that ran FreeBSD died back in 2018, so I'm unable. I'm being Justin, unable to do anything significant for it. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that this alone would mean you would, like, G5 is such old hardware, I don't care. Like, FreeBSD does not run, well, our target audience is not 20-year-old hardware. We're not a computer oh, museum OS. I commented last year um, saying, uh, okay, think, uh, I've been using only the Power 9. Uh, right, I mean, it's like, I would say you could just close this bug and it doesn't mean, it has no bearing on whether or not we continue to support the architecture because it's just so old it doesn't matter. It's like saying, does the fact that someone has a, Laptop from 1996 that FreeBSD i36 panics on, maybe remove the i36 port. Well, no, because it's just too old. Um, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I think that this is not relevant to the discussion, but things that are relevant to the discussion might be that we have more recent hardware in the cluster that no, we can't get anyone to help with cluster admins fix so it doesn't, so that it actually boots. Um, or if you do look at the survey data, if you added up all the PowerPC users together, you'd have to multiply them by a couple times to get to the next architecture of both 32 and 64 bit. Um, so like, there are some other data points. This one may not be the best, most high quality signal. I think uh, one point is that people who use or particularly care about PowerPC on FreeBS FreeBSD on PowerPC um, on Power64 um, need to make the community aware of their use and their willingness to support it. Yes. <coughs> um, is this, this is kind of a placeholder. Is there something actionable you intend to do here? Is this, is this bigger than, I mean, is this ARMv7 SSC review? Is that what this is about? Yeah, it's like things like the... Here, wait for the mic. I'm looking at Warner, by the way, for stream people. Uh, the SOC review that Mono uh, and I put on here last time, 
was to just make sure that the SOCs that we have kernels for actually work. Um, and this would be like retiring things like the Texas Instruments support with some of the Texas Instruments support, which doesn't work. Like the old Panda boards just don't work at all um, anymore because uh, the DTS in Linux ha is a moving target and nobody's kept up, for example. So that it's to review everything we have and to kill it. This is mostly uh, – Mono has been pretty good about doing that every six months or so anyway. So – Okay. Um, do we still have FTP D in the tree? Yes. For <coughs> days at most. <laughs> so Alan says yes for days at most. <laughs> um, so uh, the, I don't know if Des is on is active on IRC. Oh, well, actually, I don't, I don't know that this is actually assigned to him. There's like two or three places in the tree where we still have. Does encryption and it's for like really ancient crap, like uh, <laughs> some weird, weird Kerberos stuff. Or like, like it's, uh, also, also the SMBFS, right? I think it's one of the last two consumers, maybe the only in kernel consumer of this now. Yeah, Des. <laughs> that was worth the price of admission. <laughs> um, thin mail. That piece is not here for such a bold statement. Um, all right, it's not from last year. I'm going to look at Warner for the next one. Sure. And actually, I could also, maybe not for 15, but at some point, um, bias boot on AMD64 might be in danger of being uh, a yeah, dodo. So bootloader fourth support, I think we can kill, but I haven't confirmed that with uh, uh, Juniper. They were the okay. last known user. Um, and BIOS boot is not for 15. Too many people use it in too okay. many weird places, even though it's uh, very old. There's some VM environments that make it difficult to use UEFI. They're disappearing, but I don't think they'll be gone in a year and a half. Makes me sad, but okay. It makes me sad too, <laughs> but, you know, we live in an imperfect world. Okay. But I think now is the time to have that discussion and have notices in man pages. Yeah, I'm wondering about do we at what point should we have something in the release notes saying you, like uh, you're you're uh, you're running with scissors if you continue to do bias booting at some point you'll you'll trip or something like that. Like in particular, if someone installs a new uh, free FreeBSD installation today. With bias boot, that's something that you should be aware of. In yeah, yeah. Do, should we have? A, should we throw up a dialog box in the installer if you decide yeah. that you want to do that instead of EFI? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, like the 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 dialog box idea for for something like that, especially if you're on a machine that does support UEFI, like that that does sound like good. Yeah, because like I'm because I think there there might be a good amount of folks who just might be unaware that their machine, you know, like for, for some folks who have been using x86 for quite a long time, they might not be the most aware about even, even to this day about the presence of UEFI. Uh, but the other, the other issue is that even like relatively new machines, I would say even from like 10 years ago, like even server hardware, they don't even support UE. Like I have, I've, I have a donated um, HP ProLiant that doesn't have UEFI at all. And that was from like 10 years ago um somehow um, but also even like even machines from like 10 years ago that did support uefi the uefi was actually not even implemented properly enough um such that like like not implemented properly as in like it had the the, the efi like file had literally has to be named boot x64.efi or else it will not boot sort of deal um there was there was a lot of copy paste crappy implementation last decade so you know it's it, it's just something to think about, like because especially since it was pretty crappy la at least last decade, and it might still be crappy now. And do think about what hypervisors and cloud providers might still be stuck in BIOS land. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, mean, I realize, I mean, I, I have one of the desktops that's uh, whatever, not Sandy Bridge, the next one that has EFI, but previously won't boot happily with it in the installer. I think in the installer, by the way, we can only tell which way you booted, not what way you could have booted. Correct. Like, we don't have a good way to say, can you do EFI? We just know which way did you come in. Um, so I definitely think we could wind that if you came in via EFI and then you asked to, to install with a BIOS, we should probably kick you over the head pretty hard um, or something like that. But <laughs> It's like how you said the dangerously dedicated thing. Y'all, most many of you are too young to know that existed. Um, <laughs> some of you may not have been born yet even. Um, okay, but, so we need to think about a strategy for at least starting to warn people when we can find places where it makes sense to warn, I think. Uh, server component, yellow pages, or NIST is the newer spelling from not the last, that's, they're both in the old millennia. Um, I don't know, is Devs Online or anybody else care about these things? I definitely think, feel like this is the server bits of this could definitely live in ports easily, I believe. I mean, LDAP lives in ports. I don't know why we can't have the NIST server live in ports. Um, did Manu, someone could maybe check to see if these are actually killed yet or if they're still open? Ah! Okay. You wonder, do you still want to kill this cam target driver? I don't know anybody that's using it, but I uh, also want to double check with uh, uh, Mav to make sure that nobody's using it. And Ken, Mav is here. To, um, <laughs> He's giving a thumbs down. <laughs> Kill it? Kill it with fire? Okay, yeah. Yes, I still do. Uh, there, I don't think there'll be any pushback. I think we're good to go. That's. That's no, different. he's using CTL. Yes, that's different. That's he's completely different. That's completely different. I, I, one of the changes I lost was put in parentheses, no, not CTL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. nobody's used this in a long time. I think we can just delete it um, and uh, with a post to Arch that says, hey, I'm going to delete it. Okay. Yep. Uh, finger D? I probably could. I don't care. You definitely don't want to expose it to the internet. Yeah. Could it not just be an INET D wrapper thing? I don't know. I have no strong opinions. I only use it over local anyway, like SSH to a box in my finger. Yes. I, Free fall finger, that's what I use all the time. Um, I will probably still kill these things. I did f figure out that 3DFX does have a PCI attachment, but I think I don't care. Um, if you remember this hardware, I think, well, I was, yeah. I think uh, I'm probably the only person that ever used this driver. <laughs> and I haven't used it for more than 20 years, so I think it can die. <laughs> uh, so we, I was cleaning up the, I had a recent change where I, moved more stuff to the x86 notes out of AMD 64 and i386 where I discovered that we have a 3DFX like Linux thing that is only i386 only and not on enable, enable for AMD 64 or even for Linux 32. Like it's, it's hacky. No one's using this thing. Ah, Syscons. Ed, what do yeah. we... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such enthusiasm. It, it, it gets... Pushback um, and some legitimate com it gets pushed back oh, yeah, and some yeah. legitimate commentary um, every time uh, deprecation comes up. Um, uh, and the NVIDIA driver needs a VT backend. That would also help. Yeah, yeah. There's there are Shouldn't there are hard. there are a small number of um, of VT improvements that need to be made for full parity with Syscon. Say what? They actually, so uh, a want should be uh, a VT backend for NVIDIA drivers, certainly. That's definitely a want. Yeah. I mean, I, I would hack on it maybe if I, at some point, I've thought about it. But yeah, we should add a, we should add a want for that. Um, so you said PowerPC, 
Is PowerPC missing the VT backend? Which is easier to remove? Which is easier to do? Uh, RM PowerPC or write a VT backend? <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Does they let they don't have like the OS open firmware frame buffer or something? So doesn't that have a VT binding? Oh, uh, whatever. Okay. Even better. Uh, various drivers. So Brooks, are you still interested in? Looking at more Ethernet drivers than than before. Uh, I think it's probably worth doing a sweep. I don't know if I'll get distracted and do it or not. Someone should do a sweep. Um, but it's we, it'd be nice if we had better statistics on what was being used. Um, yeah, data would be good. Uh, as opposed to there's there's a bunch more junk in there that should go away at some point, but I haven't like gone and checked to see if there's, you know, PCI only devices, not, you know, PCI use. Yeah. I mean, I want to kill kind of anything that's not a, it's easy that's not really just LPC. Uh, that should definitely be burned in a fire. Um, then one is on the hook for cam drivers, um, some of whom have better names than other, I don't know, all these names are terrible. Yeah, all the names are terrible, but um, <laughs> we need to do a review and look at the old ones, particularly the ones that still touch giant. Yeah, or all those need to, I think those are all mostly ancient. I'd like to kill all the ones that have blobs. Yeah, I would kill the ones with blobs. Just They're not generic. Um, Sys and MVS are really old, probably no longer relevant, but um, posting the... Uh, Arch will find that out, or Mav will throw something at me. I'm, I'm looking. I'm <laughs> waiting. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I just want to, yeah. Okay, so I, I just want to look at them to see if there's any we can eliminate. Um, uh, as well. PMS was basically a commit and... It was uh, a drive-by and abandoned where and it's okay. horrible. Exactly, so... I'll say it. Yeah. It's, it's aptly named, sort of, something. Um, I think this is... Oh, oh Colin's... Uh, he's checking on the slide, so he's not here, but I think he... Uh, I think these are still valid. Um, ACPI safe timer uh, is like a fallback that only matters on I386. So when I386 goes, it'll go. There were some very old chipsets that were the little time counter for the P2X4 chipset was kind of broken. So we had to be, have a careful version. Um, we talked about 32 bit platforms. Our, this really is merged with I386 kernel. So those are the same thing. Yeah, well, I think ARMv6, if we plan to do sooner, ARMv7 will stay longer. In fact, ARMv7, we plan to keep as the longest 32 bit platform. It'll do one more release than everybody else. Because um, I think v6 is like a single thing, right? It's just Raspberry Pi 0 or something? Oh, make sure you keep getting, just give one of the mic. Um, especially in the next one. Uh, uh, how much of this, because I think we still have a lot of CPU type soft stuff still floating around. We do. We it should all die in a fire. Yeah, we, 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 could, we, we still can build for this, but no, nobody wants, we still have support in the tree to allegedly build for this. But nobody nobody's going to use it. The one project at Juniper that was going to use it isn't. Uh, so I we think we revive just a kill it. Terminal room tradition tonight. <laughs> oh, it's worth. This is the, the so ARM had this weird thing where it would do uh, floating point uh, stuff, but had an API that passed it in uh, integer. Yeah, registers. it's like soft float, but you still use the registers for your calling convention. It's hard float. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's and he's saying poor gas. Hard, hard <laughs> lat match. 
hard, hard, no, it's hard float instructions, but a um, integer register API. Oh, oh, never mind. So I had it backwards. Oh, okay. See, I, I can make it worse. And and we have all these glorious. That's not the right word. I think we removed the LD.SO support. I think the LD config crap is gone. I think but I, I think killed that, but I but we still can build for it. And yeah, I think the CPU type and checks are still around. And well, there well there's some of that is soft, and there's kind of a weird overlap. Yeah, there's. <laughs> well, we got rid of risk five soft float that also got and MIPS, and that helped but also the, alleviate. The, I think we can kill the power stuff because it's 32 bit. And we're not planning on having any 32-bit compatibility for power. It's there. FreeBSD 32 is there for PowerPC 64. It, it compiles. Uh, we need the support in the kernel, but we're not going to build uh, PowerPC 32-bit libc um, directly, just with the compat 32. Basically, so we can do dash M32 support. Right, yeah. And that M32 support doesn't support all the weird float. Crazy okay, all right. Things, so. that's, that's what I, okay, sounds good. Um, so Mark has, I, th I think these are new. Oh, these are kind of interesting. Um, the first one is more boring. So <laughs> do we need to still swap out kernel stacks because they're tiny and we get all sorts of fun issues with, because while you're asleep, things on your stack can go away. Yeah. If, if you put them in a linked list and then do that, and then lots of fun happens. So as, as a memory, memory saving measure under load, we can swap out kernel stacks. And that has implications all over the kernel. And we're saving, when we swap out a kernel stack, we free up 16 kilobytes. Um, and <laughs> it's just not very much. And and then we have to back it later. And then we have weird edge cases that if, it, like, we, when we have to go find the backing store and we had pinned the thread and it was in one number domain, but now that domain is empty, so yeah, now we've exactly. got to go find crap in another one and oh, well, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that mechanism is very old. There's even a, <laughs> if you want, there's a syscontrol you can enable and the kernel will just do it for idle processes. It will just like automatically swap out your stack. Is that a panic like, implementation? Sorry? Is that a panic implementation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just feels like a very old and probably not very important mechanism um, given how much complexity and, and how many bugs it seems to be involved in. Um, and I would like to just remove it. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone strenuously disagrees with that. Kirk wants to talk. Oh. He probably used a machine where it did matter. <laughs> so... That that got put in back in the Vax days because <laughs> it, was, it was critical to be able to recover that memory when there was a gazillion, well, a lot of processes running. And even back then, it took us months to get to the point where we got the kernel stable again. And as much more complicated as things have gotten today, I can't believe that it's gotten any easier to deal with. And I agree, it just is utterly unnecessary today. So get rid of it and save all that code. Like, why not swap out Yeah. The amount of memory you'll get back by getting rid of all that code is probably more than the amount of the stack. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that's a win. Um, yeah, let's have some plus ones. Yes. I, we get like. Do we get like plus a thousand or something? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, this is an interesting one. So, I, I, do you mean that if you take out options SMP, you get an error, like like hash error or something? Something like that. Basically, saying that if you remove SMP from your kernel, either either that means nothing, in the sense that like. An AMD 64, AMD 64 kernel is intrinsically SMP. Like there's no if def code that changes. Okay. Like any, sorry, any mock def. The reason this I want to do this is we have a whole separate set of TLB invalidation implementations <laughs> for not SNMP kernels, and they were broken with PCIDs for a long time, and nobody noticed, and I wasted like two days uh, only to discover that. That's interesting. We used to do this. Um, 
We used to emit the lock prefix for atomics. I think we and still I, and do. We, st the we still do. I thought we got rid of that to just screw it in the kernel. We just do it always. And I think certainly in user land we do it always. But I thought we just said we do it always because we used to. <sighs> on iThread 6 at least, and maybe it was only on iThread 6, we would actually make kernel modules call a function for every atomic op so we could hide the lock or not. And I was pretty sure the cost of the function call was worse than if we had just used lock all the time. Um, may maybe it's just that for KLD module we do it always, and maybe in a UP kernel we still omit it. Uh, but it's kind of not worth doing. It's something like that. Yeah. I, I haven't, I checked this like last year because that's when I started getting frustrated by this stuff. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's it's effectively a micro optimization that I don't think people are using because again, TLB invalidation was broken for a while and that caused all sorts of interesting problems. And yeah, so I guess I'm wondering, does anyone you know compile AMD64 with no options SMP? Like maybe if you're really interested in micro optimizing your single vCPU VM or something, I don't know. I have a config so that occasionally when I build, it will get built as part of a universe so I'll know if I broke it. Yeah. That's all I have. I spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for 5.2 so that we could have an SMP kernel boot on UP so we could give one. Yeah. But these days, I mean, I don't know. It, yeah. I, I don't think it gets used, and it's a whole bunch of really complicated SM, like the, the TLB, the, yeah, the PMAP code just gets more complicated as yeah. a result. And that code is already way too big and complicated. So. But uh, uh, it should say he's he's talk. he's working on this talk. Um, I think it still doesn't matter. I I, I mean I can check very quickly. I, he's in IRC, so he's okay. I bet though that his VMs still have probably more than one CPU, or at least want the ability. Yeah, and, and Firecracker. That that doesn't surprise me. Now the question is, are there other architectures for which the same thing is true? Look. Okay. I, I think it is unwise for us to have whole duplicated blocks of code under ifdef with one case being one that's never used or tested really. Um, so I think, I mean, whether or not we completely remove the option or make it not um, disallowed to, to build without it. I think we. I think it's definitely fair to to eliminate um, like duplicated code that provides an optimization for UP that we don't use or that we never actually touch. Might be polite to put in uh, an error. So let's see what what time is it? We have one more comment over here. Uh, so, what are we supposed to? We're supposed to stop at three. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Last one. <laughs> well, I was just wondering if Ed could expand on why we'd ever want to keep building. Like, why do we still want to keep building non SMP kernels? And w what would maintaining the SMP option buy us if we're going to reduce or eliminate any optimizations for it? So, I, so I think. Mark's question is under like sys AMD64, removing if deaths, but there's some things that are in like sys kern, and there are some things that are in other architectures. Um, or it's like that, that option generally is like, okay, we can do something slightly simpler than this because we get a few more. Yeah. Like I'm even thinking of, of uh, um, many cases, some of the things would fall out by the fact that your uh, like Mac CPU becomes one and so many of them devolve to like an array of one entry and so forth. So even a lot of the ones that are machine independent may not make a lot of sense to keep anymore. Like uh, like the per CPU code, right? All those arrays are sized by max CPU. And so in a, in a non SMP kernel that becomes one. So it really, oh, many I of see. those I think are even kind of gone. Maybe it's the sysinants. We, we conditionally invoke some sysinants that are supposed to spin up the APs and whatnot. But that could just be a, a sub function in the MD layer if we did. I th actually, well, yeah, no, having having a config which says I'm only ever going to have one CPU just to reduce the sizes of those yeah. arrays might be worthwhile. I don't know how much memory saving you'll really get out of that, but 
There's a bunch of global arrays, I although we fixed some of that stuff already. Well, the CPU set size is in our APIs. That's what's, yeah. and, and, and that's in general, we've tried to fix many of those things that the system calls to kind of cope with the fact that sizes might differ at runtime. Well, that's kind of, a, that's a lot of what sort of happens today. I'm, I'm, I would actually want to go look at the, the diffs. I think the diffs over time have gotten smaller in the MI code even. I would have to go look. There's, there's a few things, like in the context switch code, maybe we have some little, little micro-optimizations, like. Maybe, maybe SCED 4 BSD probably does. Yeah, or even of how really, it, like, you don't need to go look at other CPU, like, like so the, the, the run queue crap in SCED 4 BSD is definitely simpler because it's either a global thing or you have the layer of your per CPU queue, queue before the global thing. Right, right. Whereas ULE, it's always per CPU and it's, it's different. Yeah. So, but I, I don't care enough about SCED 4 BSD to like break those if defs, honestly. I don't want to go Yeah, I, I'm happy it. to just delete a bunch of AMD64 code, but um, more generally, yeah, we shouldn't, re we almost certainly shouldn't be adding new if defs along those lines. It might be worth seeing that there are some that can be trimmed that were that aren't atrocious. Um, I think related was uh, on the MD sixty four. I think it was in fourteen. We we now mandate early AP startup. I think we we made it so that if you build without that on MD sixty four, it errors. <laughs> yeah, because that kept getting broken. Um, it would be good if we got all the architectures on board with doing that. Although I know it gets a little tricky because it's harder to get IPIs working. Early. Yeah, when you want new bus to enumerate your interrupt controller sequence and IPIs, then that's when it gets messy, turns sideways. Okay, we should probably break. Um, you can still hack on the on the HackMD page. I will probably sometime tomorrow. I will do a sync. I periodically push it to where I have it on GitHub, so we can kind of have versions and see the log for what we did at each conference. Um, but feel free to keep hacking on it. Uh, I think our break is about 30 minutes. Is that right? We come back at 3.30-ish, something. Um, don't forget, I'll put the, the survey link back up during the break. Don't forget to try to uh, look at the survey if you can get a chance. And uh, we'll be back here around 3.30 for our last talk of the day. <laughs>